We see here that Monsieur McCollum has captured some German armor. Yes. Fantastic. What yeah. happened? Well, so what actually happened was I was at uh, an auction house and looking at some of their stuff and found a set of original World War I German trench armor mm -hmm. and uh, started looking it up, trying to find out more about it and realized that there's some reproduction German trench armor being made and it's kind of cool. Uh, in fact, IMA, International Military Antiques, mm -hmm. sells this reproduction German trench armor and uh, they thought it'd be cool to actually shoot one up, shoot a set of it up, so they sent us one to do that with. Fantastic. Now, yeah. World War One trench armors, because the German machine gunners were essentially in static position. Right. Machine guns at the time were emplacements. Yeah. I mean, the MG08-15, you could theoretically move, but for the most part, they were emplacements. Right. So you're in a static position, laying down fire. Yep. Probably you're, seated you're or literally in a trench. Sitting with a set of spade grips like yep. this. And you'd have a huge helmet on with some yep. reinforcement, which we don't have. And in theory, this plate there to protect you against incoming shrapnel. Yep. And maybe rifle rounds. And bullets. And handgun rounds. Yep. Right? Because the trenches got raided. Right. So this was supposed to be a little extra protection for that guy sitting there, kind of exposed behind a machine gun. Right. And they also gave him two sentries. Okay. If your job was to, you know, just stand out there and watch for the Brits or the French or the Russians to mm -hmm. show up, then you're kind of an easy target. So well, we'll, we'll give you some armor. Now, now okay. there's no back to the armor. Right. It's just the front. And uh, the cuts on the shoulders here are far enough out, they give really good protection but you physically cannot shoulder a rifle. Now, there were later models where they actually added a cup that allowed you to shoulder a rifle, but they're kind of hard to find fit. pictures of. Yeah. Um, now, I did read about Sturmtruppen using this, but they weren't using rifles. They were using MP18s or artillery Lugers, and occasionally would actually wear other stuff when jumping into a trench, just in case. And that would be an example of a kind of an off-purpose use. Um, the yeah, the Sturmtruppen repurposed everything they could find. Right, so, the official... Yeah. The official um, mantra with this stuff was machine gunners and sentries. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I found some German documentation that says you were not supposed to wear this during dynamic movement like trench raiding. I'm not saying they were following the rules. But Sturmtruppen right. didn't follow the rules. That's why they were so effective at the end of the war. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So now um, we found some information. Uh, actually, the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, of all places, oh. did some testing on captured German trench armor. Um, and they published this in 1920. And what they found is it had a very high Brunel hardness. But they said between 320 and 5 something? 360 and 520. Okay. Which, and 520 is really a... That's very hard. A questionably hard. It's modern uh, rifle plate steel. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, suspiciously hard. Maybe, you know, who knows. What but there's a big variation there, which goes right. to tell you that there's something going on with the heat treatment process exactly. in Germany that's not consistent. So, yeah, the, the steel available to the Germans at the time was kind of a mishmash, you know? They were throwing everything in their economy into this war effort. And Even could... bells off of churches. Exactly. Yeah. And so you, if you were making the armor, you didn't get to just call up the metal supplier and order your specific exact alloy. So, um, in fact, the, the New York Museum tested three different sets, and the chemical composition varied quite significantly on them. Uh, one thing that was fairly common, it was uh, they used a, a kind of a mid-carbon steel. Mm -hmm. uh, the lowest one was a 0.2% uh, carbon that went up to a 0.39%. So on that note, this came in as a reproduction, yes. and we took the bottom scallop plate off yep. and sent it to a metallurgi metallur metallurgical analysis lab in Phoenix. Right. That's hard to say. Yes. And what happened? Uh, so they took it apart, uh, chopped up the bottom plate, tested it for us, and what we have come to the conclusion of is that this is mild cold rolled steel. Um, it's low carbon. It is not surface hardened. This has a Brunel hardness of, uh, they said, 114 has a tensile strength of, uh, if I remember, 54,000 KSI, mm -hmm. which is it's not bad. Um, what's kind of interesting is the original armor was reported to have a tensile strength of about 65,000 KSI. So uh, what we can deduce from the, the Metropolitan Art Museum's numbers is that the German armor, it was, it was a mild steel, but it was surface hardened. Mm -hmm. So that Brunel hardness was just at the surface. So this is not going to be nearly as effective at stopping This bullets. is not a direct analog. So exactly. it makes sense. This reproduction armor is built for someone to hang on their wall or to be a reenactor with. Exactly. You don't need to go through the process of hardening the steel for that. If they had hardened this, it might have gone up quite a bit, but they didn't. So now well, this, this particular steel doesn't have enough carbon. To understood, understood. Carbon. But there was some of the process that made this not a direct analog. Right. That being said, the metal quality is a World War I metal. Eh, and that was only a few sets they tested. This is still worth shooting at, and it also yeah. represents in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were guys not, not necessarily making stuff like this, but they were taking all sorts of metal from wherever right. and putting it on under their clothes as body armor. The most famous one being Ned Kelly, but that's another story. But he had some plates on, and he actually fought a whole bunch of police off just wearing metal armor he made out of stuff. So this is worth shooting at just to get an idea of what happens with 
metal that is stuff. But right. yeah. it's interesting to point out that this is, it's the same thickness, it's the same weight um, as the original armor. They're both steel, but you know what? All steel is not the same. And changing within all practical limits, changing the hardness and changing the chemical composition of steel doesn't affect how it looks, doesn't affect how much it weighs, it's the same density, but you get significantly different mechanical properties. So, you know, it's interesting, this not only applies to armor plate, it applies to steel in general. Right, so some piece of steel that looks identical to another piece of steel, same weight, same everything, isn't identical. One could be harder, one could be made of a different composition. Right. Like in the Viking era, the Ulfbert swords, and later right. on into the Viking era, these, these swords were so famous that they had some runic Ulfbert engraved into the blade. Right. And they were a, a you know, superior swordsmith who carved his own name like a brand. And it was considered magical because right. these swords would bend but not break. They could retain an edge. And in fact, there were a bunch of fake copies right. just of, like this. of Ulfbert swords sold to unwitting Norsemen thinking they were getting an Ulfbert, because there's no way to tell it, without... They, they didn't have the option to just send it to a metallurgical testing. Phoenix didn't exist. Right. But 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 the but the steel looked the same, it felt the same, the weight was the same. They used it in combat, it shattered. Right. Not an Ulfbert. Yep. Oops. That's what we're dealing same with thing. here. So. Yeah. so, I think what we're going to do, um, we're going to test this. Uh, we know how the original armor reacted, mm -hmm. because it was tested and that information was published. Um, the original armor would stop a 30-06 round at 400 yards. Um, the original armor would shatter if you hit it with a 30 6 round at 60 yards. Okay, uh, so I think what we're going to do is start at the other end of the spectrum. We'll mm -hmm. start with a 32 auto. Um, that was the standard French sidearm of the, the First World War, or one of the A lot the of 32 French. autos running around in World War I. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to try that at 10 or 15 yards. Um, we're then going to try a 45 automatic, uh, 1911. Mm -hmm. At, at a you know fairly close handgun sort of range. 15 yards. Yeah, we'll see if that works. Yep. And then we are also going to hit this thing with 30 6 from about 300. Yes. Um, we don't expect good things to come of those. Probably won't stop that. But you never know. We'll give it a try. So because this is weaker than the original armor, anything that this thing stops, we know the original armor would have stopped. So right, so if it stops it, it definitely would have stopped it. If it doesn't stop it, it's an inconclusive result. Exactly. Yep. Oh, we're also going to shoot some 45 Colt at it. That's right. Because yeah. it's not World War One related, but I brought up Ned Kelly amongst others. In fact, Wyatt Earp was supposedly wearing plate at times. Well, that's a legend. No one's for sure. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a lead ball at 850 to 1,000 feet per second, this should definitely stop. But that's why those guys were just putting on whatever metal they could find. Right. So and we'll it's do that too. interesting to look at how the weak steel is fine against some things. Mm -hmm. And not against others. Not fine against others. Exactly. exactly. So. All right, so the first gun we're going to shoot at the armor with is an F, uh, Browning FN 1900, 32 ACP. These were around in World War I and actually fairly common in World War I. So, here we are with the uh, hit from the 32 ACP from the FN 1900. You can see that there's a nice little lead splatter there. That was an FMJ round. It did not penetrate. There's a tiny little back face deformation pattern, otherwise known as a dent in the rear of the steel. But this definitely would have protected you from a 32 ACP. And hell, that's better than nothing. Definitely. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. All right. Past but test one. Let's try it again with a 45. Yeah, I think, I bet you it'll stop it, but we're going to have a bigger dent. Okay. But we'll see in a minute. We will find out. Yeah. All right. To test this out with a 45, we actually have a U.S. Army World War One property issue 1911. So, what could be a more appropriate test for World War I armor? And uh, standard FMJ 230 grain ball. All right. So, dead center hit with a 45. It again did not penetrate. But I'll, I'll tell you what, this has a much bigger dent in the back. Uh, you know, the nice thing about solid static steel like this is, you know, if this were soft armor, that'd have hurt a lot. With this stuff, eh, that probably wouldn't have been a big deal. You'd know you got hit, but it wouldn't leave a bruise or anything. Um, but we're getting pretty close to the point where that bullet's going to go through. Although we are at 15 yards. Correct. Yeah, so. 12, 12 or 15 yards. Yeah. We don't want to go any closer because we don't want to have one of these things ricochet and kill us. Uh, by the way, don't do this at home. This is somewhat dangerous to do with uh, curved, weird-shaped armor like this. But I think maybe, uh, why, don't, why don't we go to the, the 45 Colt and see how that does. Let's do it. 
All right, so this is a Richard Mason conversion, actually. It's, um, this would have been a cap and ball gun that was converted to fire cartridge, but it is chambered in 45 Colt. I'm not shooting black powder. I don't want to deal with cleaning it, but this is a 250 grain bullet at around 850 feet per second. So this is a good simulant thereof. Let's give it a shot. And what's what's going to make the difference here is that that is a soft, an unjacketed lead bullet. It is a, unso a soft, unjacketed lead bullet, exactly. So where... It's going to see splatter. Where the 45 ACP had a, a jacket to help it penetrate, this should make a splatter, and we should see less of a, a deformation on the plate. I would agree. All right, let's find out. Let's see. So, 250 grain, 45 Colt. It made an almost similar dent. Not quite Not as quite, significant. But there's quite a dent. Pretty similar. Yeah, so quite. that bottom one there at the corner of the shadow is the 45 Auto, and the top one is the 45 I think that's Colt. the difference of a jacket, because we're looking at similar bullet velocities and weights. Yeah. Um, so what we do find interesting here is two things to mention. The British used the 455 Webley, which was a lead bullet at a little bit less velocity than 45 Colt, if I recall. Yeah. But this is quite similar, right? But here's what's most interesting. So it did not penetrate, but the splatter pattern shows you that the neck guard actually would have protected the soldier in this armor. Right. If that it... splatter would have gone up into his throat, into his throat. But because of this, it deflected it off of him. Right. So this neck guard absolutely served a purpose. Yeah. Very and, interesting. And that's absolutely what it was there for. So while it was 45 Colt, a similar, very close to a 455 Webley. Cool. And again, we can see the practical use for something like this in more of an Old West era. Where... You know, agreed, but I would say this, if I was a machine gunner, even if this didn't stop rifle armor, rifle bullets, after seeing this, I'd want this. Yeah. If I'm in a static position at a machine gun and it'll stop all the common uh, handgun cartridges of the day, great. But it also means it'll stop the shrapnel of the day. Exactly. A lot of it. And maybe not get me in the throat. I still want this, even in this condition at this lower hardness right now. Nice. So, makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is normally when we look at rifle armor, we're talking about point blank hits because that's sort of the the room clearing sort of application we think about it in today. Well, if you're running a machine gun, the opposite, the, the trenches that you're being shot at from are going to be hundreds of yards away most of the time. I mean, there are instances and a lot of instances in World War One where they're 25 yards, but there's also a lot of instances where there was exchanges of machine gun fire at over a thousand yards right. or rifle fire. And especially if you had an enemy sniper who mm -hmm. found your machine gun post and decided to just plug you in the chest, while this, I'm sure, will not stop a rifle point blank, it will stop one eventually at some distance. Or a lucky Tommy at 600 yards with his Enfield. Exactly. Makes sense. All right. So speaking of which, why don't we uh, set this up at 300 and try it with an .06? Let's do it. All right. So we have our German sentry and or machine gunner out here at 300 yards. Exactly 300. We lasered it. Right. Exactly 300. So you can see him in the center of the screen. Let's come all the way back. All right. There you are, Carl. So that's not exactly a World War One rifle you're using. No, it's a 1903 A4 Springfield uh, in the World War II sniper config with a 2.5x scope. However, it's a 1903 Springfield firing standard 30 odd six ball ammunition, military ball. So this is a very close equivalent to what they would have been firing in World War One. It just happens to have a World War II scope on it. Close enough. All right. Perfect hit. It was a little low. All right, so pretty much a perfect shot there, uh, right through basically the center of the thick chest plate. This round went through like butter, basically. Um, it shed the jacket. You can see little bits of copper jacket on the, uh, the spalling there. Made a very clean hole. On the back here, we've got a nice clean bullet hole. Uh, now the original testing was done at 400. The testing on the original armor was done at 400. And with the hardened, surface hardened armor, it was able to resist that bullet at 400. I think with this soft armor, it, even at 400, it would still go through. So this is a perfect example of all steel is not the same because a plate that looks, feels, smells exactly like this, surface hardened, that bullet wouldn't have gone through. This, because it hasn't been heat treated, doesn't have quite enough carbon content, bullet doesn't go through. Um, all right, so I have a French model of 1916 Berthier carbine. Uh, most of these were actually used in World War II, but they were developed in late World War I. Um, 
fires 8mm Lebel. A lot of people have this notion for some reason that 8 Lebel is an underpowered round. And while I suppose technically it is slightly less potent than 30 out 6, not to any significant degree. And frankly, at this distance, I can guarantee you this is going to go through that armor like butter again. But hey, you know, I have the opportunity to put some, some French firepower through some German armor, so I gotta take advantage of that chance. All right, so we kind of knew we weren't going to learn anything from this one. My shot was also a bit low and went clean through this thing. Uh, in fact, being 50 yards instead of 300 yards, it made a more significant impact in that it actually made a dent in the armor as well as a hole, where the OT-6 just made a nice clean hole. So, All right, so Carl, a little while back we did a video on exploding ammo from World War II. Now, that's not the same time frame as this World War I armor, but you know it would be pretty cool to see? Around what exploding ammo does to reproduction World War I body armor. Well, go figure. I have some PZ right here. Sweet. Soviet explosive observation ammo and got into Gaunt Sniper. So an interesting tie into one of our other videos, can you set things on fire by shooting them? Apparently, Soviet PZ can also set things on fire as the fabric inside of this is now smoldering and starting to burn. You want to pull that off so we can see it? Sure. Wow. Yep. That's what explosive ammo will do to you. So we set this guy at fire from a distance, which is kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah, I can see little glowing embers in there. Oh yeah, let's put that out. All right, go ahead. It's kind of interesting that our uh, Wiley Coyote Explodey scar is actually on the inside. Yeah. And can you pull that target down so it's in the sunlight? Yeah, just step on the head. Hold on. All right, and there is the result on our backing target from HMG. Nice big old fiery explosion. And if you'd actually been wearing that armor, that would have been you. Yeah, actually, it's interesting. Um, I, I mentioned in our one of our DMR videos where Marco Vorobi, I've talked about the Soviet armor, and he actually said it was worse to wear it because it would the bullet would go through and then you get secondary shrapnel. So he used the uh, armor in the dirt to defend his, in, in his position. This, what would happen with PZ is the front armor caused it to detonate, putting the entire blast of the fireball into your body. Yeah, that would suck. So with PZ observation ammo, actual armor that it gets through is worse than no armor, yeah. oddly. Now, of course, we should point out that uh, the PZ and this armor were never coexistent on a battlefield together. But... Well, this was a Volksturm in 45. He found some of this stuff or something. Yeah, but no, they did not coexist. It's an interesting experiment. It's just a cool video and a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that was a lot of shooting us some body armor. That was very interesting. You know, when we got the metallurgical analysis done and it came back with those kind of poor ratings, you were uh, pretty bummed. Yeah, I was like, this is going to be not very fun. And yeah. then that's why we said, let's start with pistols, see what it can happen, and then move on. But this turned out to be awesome. Yeah, I'm actually impressed that it did stop a small pistol and large pistol at a pretty close range. Yeah, I mean, the 32 ACP was a given, 45 ACP. The uh, splatter from the lead ball from the 45 Cole or 455 Webley kind of thing was really interesting to see how it deflected it. Yeah. So even with this, there was stuff to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, even though the hardness wasn't quite what it should have been. Right. Yeah. You know, I think some people are going to suggest that a 9mm probably would have gone through it. But you know what? Nobody in World War One was using 9mm except the Germans. Right. I mean, there is the theory you could pick up a captured gun or something. But, I mean, we're getting into the, uh, into the weeds here. Yeah. Yeah, the handguns in use at the time were 32 mm -hmm. with the French. Mm -hmm. um, the French had uh, the 1892 revolver, which is about the same ballistics. Mm -hmm. The Russians had the Nagant revolver, which is about the same ballistics. Yeah, pretty impotent, actually. Yeah. Um, the heaviest handgun caliber used in the war was the American 45 Auto. Yeah. Um, the Webley 455 was a little bit below it, and uh, often soft lead bullets. We did not shoot action. lead at it. I would argue that it would not have been. No, it certainly would not. Yeah, the, the 49 would have bounced off as well. Yeah, if the 45 Auto didn't go through and the 45 Colt didn't go through, 455 Webley would not have either. And, and, and 9 millimeter for that matter. However, that lack of hardness uh, doomed it. Yep. With the at 300 yards, when we shot the 30 odd 6 M2 ball at it, uh, it went right through. Shed the jacket, but it made a clean hole. Yeah. So that's where the heat treating and hardness would have made that a different set of armor. Right. 
And you know what? That's the difference between buying like a ten dollar round steel target for your range to shoot at, mm -hmm. and going out and spending the extra money to get something really good like AR five hundred. Yep. That, this is actually a lesson to be learned not only about armor but also just about buying targets for yourself. Yeah. That's why AR five hundred costs a little more, but AR five hundred will last a very long time. Yeah. And something lower than that won't. It's got to be rated to what you're shooting at it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, tune back in every week for more cool stuff from InRange TV, and uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel and tell your friends.